noticeably from the Social Sciences Humanities Research Council Canada. And as Dagmar is going to talk about a bit later, it is widely indexed. We are in the directory of open access journals. Uh, we are in Google Scholar. You can find us through Erudit, which is the uh, francophone, primarily francophone uh, database um, run out of uh, several universities in Montreal. Scopus, which is European based, and ProQuest as well, um, is also, uh, yeah, ProQuest out of the Public Affairs International Services. Uh, ser I never get that acronym. Public Affairs International Service. There, I think I've got it. All right, Dagmar, can get the next slide. Great. So again, this is just a little bit of the history of sort of where my uh, refuge came from and sort of what it's turned into over the years. Um, as mentioned, it, it originally sort of came out as sort of a newsletter, and this was very much a response in the 19, late 1970s. Some of you may uh, remember Canada uh, um, had a large movement, sort of large-scale resettlement in Indo-Chinese refugees, and there began to emerge a literature um, sort of from people interested and, and, and sort of concerned in this area about the origin, dynamics of refugee movements and policies um, related to reception, integration of refugees in Canada. So refuge sort of emerged through York University as, as a means of communication, sort of a, a way this community could talk um, to one another and also to expand itself um, in the sort of new interdis interdis uh, interdisciplinary field of uh, inquiry. And it began with relatively short academic uh, articles, often looking at sort of the state of the art or on very specific issues, um, but uh, very much has sort of grown over the years. Uh, often the emphasis was directed towards government policy, advocacy, um, more sort of almost, you know, on the ground sort of, you know, politics of, of migration. In 2000, refugee began to sort of uh, solicit longer in-depth articles to transition into a more peer-reviewed scholarly academic journal. Um, this was assisted certainly by um, uh, uh, the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council, a government agency, um, which provides some financial assistance for this transition, um, also helped us in terms of bilingual promotional material, launching our website, and also in terms of outreach for new contributors and subscribers. And since 2005, we've received multi-year funding from SHRC uh, under its aid to scholarly programs, uh, uh, journals programs, and that's what allows us uh, to remain nonprofit um, as, as a journal. In 2013, we transitioned again to an open access policy, which Dagmar will talk about in a moment or two, uh, with no article processing charges. And, and as well, all current and archived uh, issues are available for free of charge through our website. So anybody can access them from anywhere without any charge. And this policy was very much motivated by a desire to make the research available uh, to a broader audience and certainly beyond maybe the academic institutions in the global north who might be able to afford, say, a subscription to the to, to refuge, um, and instead to make it uh, uh, um, available to institutions and academics around the world, as well as those involved um, in, in various dimensions of sort of, you know, research and, and, and in fact, uh, policy in, in forced migration. So it certainly underscores our long history um, as one of the oldest journals in the field. Um, certainly our leadership in that area. It also simply allows a, a broader community to form, um, not just amongst sort of uh, um, uh, the global north, but within the global south as well, who often there are more barriers to accessing information and allows us to kind of grow our perhaps academic impact and certainly in terms of our responsibility. Do we skip ahead to there? Yeah, sorry, I keep uh, skipping. I guess I'm not an <laughs> expert at skipping slides. Sorry. Just be excited for the next one. That the acceptance rate. Okay, sorry, I, I'm trying to figure out where we were again. Okay, um, here we just have some basic data in terms of our acceptance and rejection rates. There's some slight up and down over the year, but on average, about 29% um, in a given year of, of submissions. Uh, that go through the whole process from you know first submission to a final decision. Um, about twenty nine percent on average over the years have been accepted. And I think if we go to the next slide, we can see some refugee readership uh, um, figures as well. Um, as you can see, like most journals, um, our readership is centered around where our, our, our sort of point of publication, which is North America. Um, but if you look from the left to the right, and you can sort of look at the 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 uh, y-axis, you see the numbers have been growing over time. Um, so even though they look like they're kind of comparable, uh, the actual total numbers has been growing, I think, from about 67,000 to somewhere in the 80,000 over the years. We've seen a growth in Asia. Um, and certainly this has become really important data that we've been able to collect more recently to sort of continue to figure out how we position ourselves and how we sort of continue to grow um, our presence sort of in the, in the wider sort of scholarly community 
uh, around forced migration. And one last point in terms of our growth registered users, those are the people who receive notifications of publications and our regular newsletter. Um, that's grown significantly from about 825 in 2016 to about 2,175 today. Um, so that's been an important part of the last few years to really think how to sort of expand our reach and get the scholarship out to more and more people around the world. And I think now I'm going to turn it over to Michael or Dagmar. I think it's me. Dagmar. Thank you very much. Um, when I first started to disentangle what open access means, I really did not know what all of these terms were that people were throwing around. So we thought um, in terms of why you should publish with us, we just wanted to outline the three basic models of open access that you might have seen around. And then of course, um, tell you why you should send your manuscript to us. So if you see journals that advertise that they have a green open access policy, the most important thing is that the uh, journals, the publishers often still keep the copyright for your articles. And if that is something that's important to you, it makes it harder to negotiate how else to reuse your work. So keep that on the copyright is based. Very often green open access journals also have an embargo period, so your work will not appear as open access right away. Um, it could also be that only some version of your article can be self-archived um, in an official public archive, perhaps only the pre, um, the pre, um, I don't know what it's called, the pre-version, like the version that's not been the accepted version. Um, so that's something to keep in mind with green open access. Gold open access is the step off where um, there is usually no embargo period. Um, the authors retain the copyright. You are free to distribute the final copies of your article. But the most important difference there is that it's a gold it, you have to make it open access by paying a so-called article processing fee. And as you will see in um, the next slide, these fee can, fees, depending on where you're based and whether your university or your library has access to um, one of the big uh, agreements with some of the corporate publishers, some of the fees can still be pretty high if you're not in that club of universities or libraries that have access to that. But if you're still committed to publishing publishing something open access. Um, then the third model is the smaller, we sometimes call it the platinum club, sometimes it's called the diamond club of open access journals. So that's where there are no article processing charges. So you don't pub fee, uh, you don't pay, oh God, I can't talk today. You um, don't pay to um, publish with us. Um, you retain the copyright, you are free to distribute um, articles, and you can also self-archive and deposit them in one of the archives. So there is quite a sliding scale um, that you should pay attention to if you care about open access. So um, these article processing charges that I'm talking about here, you see the leading English language journals in um, migration studies, and most of them also publish articles in forced migration. Um, so if you look at the Canadian rates, um, it's quite prohibitive if you are in the global north. And again, you're not affiliated with a university that has a library agreement that allows you to cover the fees that these other journals publish, but this is standard in the industry. There's quite a bit of variation if you're a, so a scholar in the global south. Some of them have fee waivers, but only for certain journals. And um, sometimes if it's uh, not a, a so-called hybrid journal, then you also cannot get that fee waiver. But um, it is still pretty standard to um, publish with a fee because that's also how other journals that are not golden or not um, platinum and diamond. That's how they make their money because they're for profit in contrast to us who are um, open access and not for profit. Um, so then again, um, why you should publish open access if you care about a wide reach in terms of who you want the readership to be. It's also a movement that is very much about creating equitable knowledge access around the globe. Um, there is a lot that if your article gets published open access, 
right away, the knowledge that you're trying to share with everybody gets disseminated more quickly. There are some studies from some um, publishers that have said that they're also more visible and cited more extensively because they're more easily accessible. When somebody Googles the topic, they find them right away. They don't hit the paywall. And again, as I mentioned, it's important because you retain the ownership over your material and um, copyright is something that I didn't used to pay attention to when I first started publishing, but it can actually be ch quite challenging if you don't own um, your own material and your own words. And you may also have noticed if you have a grant that many of the major granting agencies around the world in Canada, that's the Social Science and Research Council of Canada, that it um, now has open access publishing as a requirement for how you disseminate your results. So that is also one of the reasons why you should publish with us if you are a forced migration scholar. And um, then again, why you should publish with us, as you can see um, in this graph, um, refuge articles are getting increasingly more attention. The journal has been around since the 1980s. So you always have to take some of the official um, impact factor discussions with a grain of salt because many books, many edited um, volumes are not taken into account in some of the official impact factor calculations. Refuge has received um, an so-called impact factor for the first time in 2023, along with um, many other so-called emerging sources. And I'm happy to discuss the limitations of these impact factors and the other bibliometrics with you later on if you want in the question and answer period, because that's something I've learned too much about as the editor-in-chief of the journal. But if you are a refuge author, or if you're thinking about publishing with us, um, it's interesting to go to the landing page of each of the refuge articles. So if you click on the digital object identifier or the DUI and you scroll to the bottom of the landing page of each of our articles, you can see how many times the article has been um, read and cited. And read, you can get your own usership statistics and it's dynamic. So if you click on the Google Scholar link, then you can also immediately go to Google Scholar and see how many times it has been cited there. But the most important thing is, of course, more people are reaching and discovering refuge, and we're pretty excited about this dynamic increase that you can see in the chart on the right. And now I think I'm handing this over to Michael to talk a little bit about our publication process. Yeah. Um, thanks, Dagmar. Um, so yeah, I'll just quickly uh, run through some of the, the publishing process here uh, at Refuge and, and talk through some of the um, steps in, in uh, having an article published uh, in, in the journal. Um, so in, in general, uh, we're, we're publishing high quality, original, uh, empirical, theoretical research. Um, and uh, in in doing so, we subject uh, each article to to the peer review um, process. So with that, um, when we get the initial uh, submissions, uh, they come in and they are reviewed by uh, the editorial team. Uh, and this is kind of where we're looking to see, uh, you know, how does the article fit within the sort of um, thematic focus of the journal? Um, there's a, a series of uh, sort of uh, requirements that we have for um, publications in terms of, um, you know, citation style, uh, length, all of that uh, kind of stuff. And so we want to make sure that um, all of those boxes are ticked at, at the initial stage, uh, at which point um, we will either uh, approve it for um, uh, peer review or we will uh, send it back to uh, the author um, for uh, sort of uh, more changes or anything like that before actually submitting. Uh, then when we go to the, uh, uh, the double anonymous peer review, um, we we typically try and have uh, three um, peer reviewers uh, of some sort of uh, expertise as it relates to that uh, particular article. Um, they provide uh, often um, very good detailed and thorough feedback for the authors in, uh, uh, in the publication process. Um, 
and they will provide recommendations for us on um, whether or not they feel uh, this is a, a publishable piece, uh, what revisions might re be required in order to do so. Uh, and then we will convey that to uh, to you as as the author. Um, and from there, we make the decision on uh, whether this will be a, a revise and resubmit, where we will give you an opportunity to uh, go through the comments from the um, the peer reviewers uh, and make the required uh, uh, changes for publication. And this can kind of be a back and forth uh, cycle, depending on how uh, how well or how um, effectively the uh, revisions are taken up uh, in that um, process. And uh, eventually uh, at the end, we will get you to uh, hopefully uh, an accepted article and, and publication with uh, Refuge. Um, so yeah, Dagmar, do you wanna move on to the uh, special issue slide? Thanks. Um, so yeah, uh, Another option uh, for you to publish with uh, Refuge is through a special issue. Um, and so uh, normally we, we get two or three, uh, or we publish two or three special issues uh, each year. Um, and uh, these are um, generally uh, kind of special focus or, or, or topics that uh, come from panels or workshops, um, specific uh, research projects or, or, or groups that are uh, ongoing. Um, with that, we generally have, uh, our requirement is to have uh, at least five um, uh, papers and uh, th they need to go through the peer review process as well. Um, and uh, it also requires that the uh, uh, guest editors um, also contribute uh, an introduction um, uh, for that uh, for that process as well. Uh, if you take a look on our uh, on our website, you can see all of the uh, kind of detailed um, uh, requirements that we have for um, for submitting a special issue um, with. Uh, refuge. Um, and uh, yeah, if you have any questions about that, um, please, uh, you know, feel free to contact us and we'll, we'll see how, uh, see how that works um, or see how that fits within our, our uh, publication plans for the year. Um, but yes, I believe that's, uh, that's it for that. Uh, and then yeah, so the the uh, third option uh, as well, uh, we have a very active um, book review uh, section um, for uh, the journal. Um, basically, this is an opportunity for you as uh, scholars to provide book reviews on um, scholarly uh, uh, manuscripts that have come out um, uh, in and around the area of uh, uh, refugee studies and forced migration. Uh, and so uh, uh, Emily uh, Arnold Fernandez is our uh, book review editor for this. Um, and so uh, if you have a book that you are interested in reviewing, um, please get in contact uh, with, with Emily and, uh, and uh, she can talk you through um, the, uh, the process and whether or not that book has already been um, scheduled for review or anything like that. And so she can help with the coordination um, for the book reviews. And these are also very widely uh, uh, read uh, as well. Um, I, again, especially for, uh, I, I found for myself uh, going through um, uh, comprehensive uh, exam studying was a was a, a very useful tool um, and it gives you a lot of um, really good critical insight into some of the new new literature that's coming out um, uh, in the field uh, so yeah I will I think that's it um, Dagmar yep I think that's me so thank you very oh, much. Yeah. That's the um, substantive content that we have. And um, we there were already some questions and useful reminders. So um, we are happy to take your questions. If you want to put them in the chat, that would be perfect. Then we can take it from there. And Michelle doesn't have to figure out how to unmute people. But let me just 
Um, also remind you that the refuge at yorku.ca email goes to Victoria and myself. We're happy to answer all of your questions afterwards. And that's the link to the refuge website that we can also, if we have time, show you so that you can see some of the articles that we have been publishing lately. Um, but again, feel free to reach out and somebody already asked the question. Yes, we will be circulating the slides to everybody who um, signed up for the webinar afterwards. And then we'll also tell you where the recording will be shared because we um, have access to sharing it via, I think, the CRS YouTube channel so that um, I have to discuss with Michelle, but I think that's where it will be shared. And um, um, Michelle just posted also a reminder that they can also get credit for having attended and that um, for listening for the CRS um, certificate and diploma program. But now I have to see if there is a particular, oh, do we have um, an upcoming deadline where you can, no, we don't have a particular deadline for proposals, um, Rajad, we take them on a rolling basis and then we can tell you whether we have the capacity to accommodate another special issue and um, when we would be able to accommodate that because we um, are a not-for-profit and therefore we have to make sure that we are still able to publish another issue within our budget. And our budget comes from the funding that we get from the Social Science and Research Council of Canada. If of course you have also um, funds that you can contribute to publishing, then sometimes we're able to um, publish some extra articles if there is an extra grant that you have received and you perhaps can um, help pay our copy editor or the uh, typesetting service that we use. So that again, um, in the end result, we're not profiting from the publication process. That's the commitment to Diamond Open Access. Any other questions from the audience? And I can probably unshare my screen now. So uh, hold on, make sure I don't click on the wrong thing again. I see there are a few more questions the circulation of the journal and the readership. Um, we have on our um, the list, and maybe I should, um, if you're interested in that, go back to the slides. We currently have over 2,000 people who are signed up to receive our newsletter. Um, that is the one statistic that Chris mentioned. But then in terms of readership statistics, we are an international journal. So we are um, fairly heavily being read in North America because that's where we are based. But we also have a readership in all of the other continents. But if you're interested, you can also look at the slides with the readership statistics afterwards, or I can reshare them, or I can just scroll back to look at some of the numbers again, if you actually are interested in the numbers. So um, North American users was um, like 28,000, uh, European 17,000. I don't know, we had a total of um, 87,000 in 2001, and I think we've just been increasing. So it's actually quite substantial. I was just astonished because I have to publish a report um, if we apply for funding again, it's just astonishing to see, I think also with the interest in forced migration in general, how the readership has increased. Does anybody want um, to take, I'm just looking at the questions, Chris and Michael, do we want to um, answer any of the other questions? I'm just reading them. I could take yeah. a, oh, go ahead, Michael. <laughs> yeah, I was just going to say um, to the uh, um, the question on film reviews is something that we've um, we've talked about doing uh, at uh, um, our editorial meetings, and and this is something that we are definitely open um, to incorporating. If uh, again, if it's something that uh, fits within the context of. Uh, uh, refugee and forced migration studies. I think that that would um, that would be a good uh, fit, and and similar. It, it would be a similar uh, review process to um, uh, the the book review. So it would be a, a shorter submission, 
Um, but uh, that is definitely something that we would be uh, open to to doing and and talking with you about in terms of you know what your interests uh, would be in that and, and uh, how how you might like to look to do that. Um, but yeah, all that to say, it is definitely an option um, and and something that we are open to at the at the journal. And if you want to look at some of the samples, um, we've published film reviews in the past, so we can um, share some of the, perhaps some, I can put a link in a minute for one of the past film reviews in the chat if you're particularly interested in that. We try to only review films that are in public circulation. We've sometimes had trouble because we need to get the um, possible reviewer access to the film. So if we have trouble giving the reviewer access to the film, obviously it's challenging then for refuge audience members to view it. So we try to make sure that there is a distribution licensing are available for the film that is potentially reviewed. And our previous uh, book review editor, Raluca Bejan, had a particular connection because she had been doing documentary filmmaking. So we've had quite a few of them in the past. I see lots more questions now, so maybe we can alternate in taking them. Sure, I, I can take the next. Um, the top of the list uh, is from Alam RJ from... Uh, um, Rohingya refugee and and asking whether there's opportunities. Um, I think in this context, um, if it's about more scholarship type opportunities to study in Canada, that would not be something that we have connections to because for us, we're primarily sort of an academic sort of research journal. Um, so that would sort of be probably be a different sort of conversation within sort of, you know, a university or campus context. Um, so I'm not sure if that, if that was the sort of the overall you know, sort of focus of the question, um, then yes, in terms of what we do at Refuge, uh, we would be primarily be more about academic research and publication type opportunities rather than um, uh, continuance of academic education opportunities. So I don't know if that helps as an answer, um, but I think I think that would get to your question there. Um, there's somebody asking if we have a particular call for special issues at the moment. Sometimes we've had particular themes where we were looking for articles for. We have a couple in preparation, but it's usually that somebody approaches us with a theme. So for example, currently we have the special issue on bureaucratic violence. And because we are on a continuous publication cycle, so that means that we're able to publish articles as soon as they go through the peer review process that Michael um, talked about. So there's still more articles for bureaucratic violence that are in the process. A couple of them just uh, went to copy editing um, that are still going to be coming out. So it's usually that people approach us with special issue proposals. And again, we're accepting proposals on a rolling basis. So if you are, since Sophia is asking a question, if you are interested in um, putting something together, otherwise just drop us a line and um, we're happy to chat with you about um, whether that would be a good fit with us. Yeah, and I can just uh, jump to the uh, next question about, uh, uh, could we elaborate on the thematic fit? Does Refuge accept articles on the intersection between the fields of law, uh, different fields of law, for example, environmental and refugee uh, law? Yes, that uh, that's definitely something that, that fits within the context of what we're doing. Again, um, as long as it is speaking to kind of the, um, you know, broader thematic goals of the uh, of the journal, um, we're definitely open uh, as an interdisciplinary journal. We're we're open to publications from from all sort or uh, submissions from all sorts of fields, and so uh, yeah, we'd be happy to um, review something on the intersections of, of environmental and, and refugee law. Um, uh, yeah, uh, for a future publication, that'd be great. Um, and Alexandra, um, if you look at the Refuge Archives, you will notice that we've had a special issue on, I think, the environment and refugees quite a while ago. I can't remember off the top of my head. So there's definitely been something that uh, Refuge has published in this area before. Um, and for the law scholars, we just have to tease them that they like their footnotes. So it's um, going to sometimes be a bit challenging that our page limit is a little bit shorter because law people like to go on for longer, but we do have a guest. We also have a co-editor who's a lawyer 
who um, can also make some suggestions if you uh, have some questions about citation formats, but we can also help with that. But yes, I think this will also be an area, um, given climate change, where lots more, we're expecting lots more publications. Okay, and I can take one, I'm gonna leave the impact factor one for you, Dagmar, I think you might have a little more sort of knowledge on that, but the question about how long does a publication process take from start to finish? Um, I'm gonna to have to say it varies, uh, like many things do, because there's a couple of factors in play. Um, one is we really rely upon the peer review process uh, and the peer review process is not always in our control. Um, sometimes peer reviewers will find an immediate sort of time on their desk, right, in order to get the peer review done. Sometimes they may have a lot of other things in their plate and it may take a while to get that um, sort of second or third review in. And we want to make sure we have enough peer review uh, um, in in order uh, to sort of get some quality feedback to the, to, to the author um, and to make sure that, you know, we're, we're, we're accepting or declining uh, manuscripts on sort of for the right reasons. So sometimes that process can, you know, stretch out um, for a few months, just depending on how much we're able, because obviously people do peer review on a voluntary basis, right? So we, we, we cannot certainly command a peer review. Um, sometimes we may put a, a bit of moral suasion or put a pressure on through emails, hoping to get it in earlier. Uh, and then it has to come back to us. And then it really depends on the, the, the um, in that sense, the quality of the article as it stands. Sometimes after the peer review process, there may be a lot of feedback, um, wanting sort of some pretty significant changes to be made in order for it. Uh, to sort of meet sort of the, the standards for a certain academic peer reviewed journal. Other times it might be, you know, all, you know good to go. Um, those are rarer uh, in general, but sometimes it'll be an article that really doesn't need a lot of change. It is actually been presented um, into the process in, at, at, a, at a level where it's essentially ready for publication. Um, so if, in that case, it's gonna be a very quick turnaround. Other times there might be where, you know, after peer review, it goes back to the authors and it depends how long the authors take. And then we get it back from the authors. Uh, and then there might be a second round of peer review sometimes, just depending on whether they were able to sort of address all the, the concerns and questions. And so I don't know, Dengar, if we have specific sort of statistics on that, but I mean, a very short one is really because all the peer review lines up really quickly and the article is a very high caliber. And then we're talking, you know, process of, I'm guessing, and, and we have space in the journal, right? Because we have to factor it into which issue is going to be in. Um, and so that could be a process, I might, would benchmark, would half a year be sort of an adequate or four months, Dagmar, do you think, for something that's, everything is in place. If everything's not in place, it can stretch out. Um, and again, some of that is out of our control. Some of it's the peer review process. Some of it's the 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 quality of the uh, article itself and the time it takes those authors um, to sort of get the revisions back to us. Um, I think it's important to emphasize, because we talked about this in preparation for the webinar, how we're unusual that we give a lot of feedback at the front end. So what may look like in the statistics, like a desk reject, is actually something that comes with comments and suggestions, I would say, 90% of the time. Because that is, I think, also our commitment to the field, that we really like to make sure that somebody who sends something to us doesn't walk away without any comments and recommendations. And that's also because we're interdisciplinary and sometimes we're getting things that are either out of bounds. So sometimes we've suggested different journals or we really get something where the organization and the flow, the contribution isn't clear. So we always try to make suggestions at the front end. And that I think really is important to emphasize. So if something flies through the process that is really dependent on everything falling into place. <clears throat> and um, if there are delays, we of course try to make sure that we nudge the peer reviewers. Um, but I think the front end, the rejection, we really try to give as many comments as possible. Also mentor graduate students who are maybe submitting something for the first time. So I think we're very conscious of how hard it is to overcome the hurdle at the beginning, but we also don't want to um, send things to peer reviewers that really aren't of acceptable quality. So that's also why the front end screening gets taken very seriously, but we also keep in touch with the authors. Um, to what extent uh, the editorial board gives priority? The editorial board, I guess that's the editorial team, that would be us, um, and their questions are moving. Some articles might not need use theoretical frameworks. Um, it depends, right? If you look at refuge archives, we have some articles from practitioners and some of the examples, for example, that we published that are talking about 
COVID and the impact of COVID, there were still some practitioners that are talking about, for example, intersectionality and how differences in the refugees and the makeup of the refugees and their backgrounds, how the differences in who they were affected um, how um, COVID um, services and healthcare clinics, for example, were developed. And um, so I think even some of the more practical articles have a um, theoretical framework. But yes, of course, we do take that into account. But again, um, you can reach out to us and we can have a look at the manuscript to see if there's maybe something we can suggest. And if you want to give us the sales pitch, why your theoretical framework might be a little bit softer, we're happy to go back and forth on this as well. And yeah, just in terms of uh, how does Refuge approach publishing more theoretical work versus empirical work, um, you know, this is something that we're, we're open to, um, to everything. And I think that this does sort of touch on uh, one of the other questions around only interested in, in policy. I mean, uh, yes, there is uh, probably a, um, uh, we have a lot of interest from policy oriented uh, folks in the journal. And so that, that does tend to be a lot of what um, we do publish through the, uh, through the journal, but also um, we, you know, we're very open to uh, more theoretically oriented um, pieces as well as, you know, work that has come from, uh, you know, uh, doctoral research or, or larger fieldwork projects, um, stuff like that. And so um, we're definitely, uh, yeah, open to publishing kind of uh, across the board. Um, uh, really, again, it comes down to the um, the strength of the the article and and the argumentation being put forward uh, in that um, that is is important, and then also the connection again to the the thematic area of the um, of the journal. But um, to the the second part of that question, you know, would we be able to accept a manuscript on Cameroonian refugees living in Africa? Um, Again, this is something that we'd we'd need to kind of put through the the review process, but it's it's certainly something that we would be uh, open to um, open to reviewing for uh, for the journal and uh, yeah, um, making an assessment from there and going on. Yeah, I just yeah, answered I mean, the um, impact question in the in the Q and A, but I'm not sure if everybody can see that one. Um, so maybe you guys can tell me if you can see the answer or if it just goes to the participant who answered the question. I'm not sure who asked the question, if how this works. To follow up on, I think, the some of the questions that Dagmar and, and Michael just answered, they're sort of all akin to sort of what's, what's, sort of the, what's the kind of construct you need in order to sort of publish it. It, it can be theory-oriented, it should be policy-oriented, it's more narrative stories. Um, and I think, you know, at the heart of it, it Refuge sort of, you know, positions itself as an academic journal. Um, so it's trying to contribute to a scholarly community. And so certainly for our articles, um, again, with Dagmar saying, there are always a few exceptions if we're doing something particular, for example, responding to COVID and, and sort of trying to think about, you know, very rapid knowledge mobilization and just sort of experiential mobilization around COVID. Um, I think for most articles, we are looking for that article to position itself within a literature. Because um, what we're looking for is how does the knowledge generated contribute to our understanding? Um, so the knowledge just presented on its own um, doesn't necessarily tell us the nature of that contribution. Is it adding to it? Is it challenging it? Um, is it adding and challenging? Um, so basically, what is this knowledge sort of building upon? And therefore, what directions is it taking it? So the, the, you know, so our readership can understand um, where this, these ideas come from and where they fit within a broader field of study. Um, so I think, and there's a question below, I think that came in about, you know, challenging normative um, practices. I mean, certainly there's, there's no particular um, set of positions that are kind of, I, I think, sacrosanct. It would be more with, as in any scholarly practice of trying to establish here's, you know, here's what exists and here is how what I am doing either builds upon it, challenges it, corrects it, adds to it, reinforces it, confirms it, um, extends from it. 
So I think for all those in that sense, yes, there's something that that we're looking for that you're you're basing your 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 scholarship within that field of study, whatever it happens to be. Again, whether it's more law oriented or policy oriented, we have sort of people who work in psychology who publish with us, um, social social work field, all sorts of fields publish. Um, but sort of really anchoring it within that sort of discipline or that sort of study of knowledge, so that we can understand and you can present the the ways in which your ideas are contributing to our understanding. So I think that's how I would sort of maybe round off a couple of the comments that Dagmar and Michael made, and I think get to the one further below about the normative practices. Um, somewhere there's a literature that you're either responding to if you're challenging, and therefore, what is it you're challenging? Um, and I, I wouldn't always see, you know, I think the theory and, and empirical, I think often uh, the, the two are kind of hard to separate. Um, and, and, and I think usually we're looking for that sort of, you know, whether you call it theory or at least the sort of, you know, the background of your ideas, where do they come from and what are you building upon would be important for us. And you can always um, send us an email with the manuscript rather than formally submitting it, because then we can eyeball it. We often do that as well. So rather than you putting it through the portal, going through all the steps, you can also just email us. Then we can still circulate it, and then we can tell you that way. That works just as well. It's just if you submit it more formally, then it goes on our agenda. Then we assign somebody to review it. So it depends on um, how certain uncertain you are that you want feedback and that you want to publish with us. So that's really, some of these things are harder to answer. On the Palestinian refugees, uh, yes, of course. Refuge, if you look through our archives, has published many articles on the Israel-Palestine conflict over the decades. We've had special issues on Palestinian refugees, but also on um, Jewish refugees. So if you look at the archives and you just type the word Palestinian, you will find lots of articles that we've published already. So certainly. Got to make sure I'm not missing a question. Um, how does one get involved in joining the editorial team? Excellent question. We normally have a call if there is an opening for becoming an editorial team member. And other than our uh, student um, participants, nobody is paid. Everybody is a volunteer on the editorial team. So if an opening becomes available, there will be a call that will be circulated quite widely. And um, people usually stay for a particular term. And if that term is up, there is also a call that is circulated in, in English and in French usually. And um, we have people of different seniority levels and also people who joined at different stages. So that um, is how opportunities might be available to participate and get involved. And yes, uh, graduate scholars, graduate students or early scholars, uh, Michael can speak to that because he was, when he first applied, he was still close to finishing his PhD, but then he yep. joined after he finished. Do you wanna say anything about that? Just about your experience? Uh, yeah, yeah. I'd, uh... I mean, uh, coming in definitely as a, a fairly junior um, person, it was definitely, um, you know, a bit of a, uh, uh, it felt like a bit of a, a daunting step of sorts. But I think that, you know, the team has been really incredible to work with. I think it's shown me a lot about the um, uh, sort of flip side of the publication um, uh, process, but it's also given, you know, gives you an opportunity to, again, review some of the, and participate in, in the, um, you know, knowledge development process and, and publication process as well. Uh, and so, I, yeah, the last uh, couple of years that I've been involved with the journal have been, you know, really quite uh, uh, rewarding and, and really, um, again, a great opportunity to be involved in, in some of the um, literature that's coming out in the field. Um, did we address uh, Nugosi's comment about um, policy articles? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Come uh, in terms, in yeah. I'm just looking at the, the last question there. Um, as you know, refugee population is adverse, so is their experiences. I'm wondering if you could explain the uh, expertise of the editorial team. Yeah, uh, this is something that, um, you know, we, I think, definitely... Uh, are are aware of and sensitive to uh, on the journal. Um, the uh, uh, while we may not have direct um, background or experience uh, in that from the the lived experience um, perspective, a, a lot of times when um, 
uh, you know, when we get the peer reviewers uh, involved, um, that is is uh, one opportunity that that we can um, you know have to have other other people with different backgrounds, different experiences involved in the process. And so, uh, you know, it's something that we're we're definitely sensitive to, and something that we're um, you know we are are uh, uh, again aware of and, and and working with. And so, uh, a lot of times, I think we try and uh, you know incorporate that into the the peer review process because, as you're right, I think there's a lot of different uh, experiences and backgrounds that shape. Um, uh, that 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 shape the experiences and 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 writing uh, as well, and so I think that's something that we want to be mindful of um, in in the peer review process too. Yes, and I think in terms of um, our expertise, we're also all connected um, through our networks. At the moment, I think political science is a little bit overrepresented in terms of background on the editorial team, but previous editorial team members have been in global development studies. Um, other editorial team members currently or in the past have been lawyers, but I think in terms of coverage also of Global South and Global North um, people, I think we've had people representing, I think, scholarship and research connections in all parts of the world. And um, we have had, um, I think, people with migration experience certainly on the team. I'm just thinking about a few of us who are migrants, but not necessarily forced migrants, but through the Center for Refugee Studies, we also, I think, have a lot of connections with the Toronto community. And Laurie also has a um, Center for Refugee Studies, but I forget, Chris, what the Laurie um, Center is called. So the uh, Quebec and the Moncton colleagues are also, I think, connected with their communities. And Adèle Garnier, for example, has done a lot of work on resettlement. So I think uh, we are also in our own research projects connected with many communities. It's the International Migration Research Center. Um, ah, okay. Housed around the Balsillie Center down down here in Waterloo, um, and as Michael said too, I mean, a really important part of that is the the peer review process, um, because that's where I mean our 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 role with that initial stage is really more of a question of of the overall you know sort of more academic quality rather than the substance of the piece. The peer review is when it goes out to those with sort of expertise in specific um, subject areas, um, and that's where we're trying to recruit um, you know. Uh, people who have that sort of um, um, direct um, sort of knowledge uh, and, and experience um, within the subject areas that are under discussion in, in a paper. Um, so that certainly in that front end, a lot of what our role is simply sort of more in the sense of, is it, is it ready for someone to look at? And that's why Dagmar said, often at that stage, we'll be sending comments back saying, well, it's not quite ready. Here's some suggestions um, just at academic level in terms of how, you know, the, the, the you know, scholarly work um, uh, um, uh, sort of some of the, the criteria for scholarly work that we're looking for that you can bring it so we can get it out to peer review. Um, but that knowledge sort of base of the of the peer review is I think for any journal, uh, no matter what is area where really it sort of thrives because that's where you're getting the expertise that's very direct from the discipline and from the areas brought to bear in the scholarly work. Um, yes, Mohammed, I was actually going to say that um, we're looking really for contributions studying Rohingya refugees. And we keep talking about how um, we're hoping that we will have more contributions who will be diving into this. And I think we currently have something in peer review that is um, to do with that subject. So I hope that we will be able to contribute um, through disentangling and understanding that conflict in particular. So that's been one that I think we've been frustrated about that we have not had more contributions because so if you're currently working on a manuscript, then that would be wonderful because we um, are looking for, I think, strong contributions that are diving into the Rohingya conflict. Um, also to the uh, anonymous attendee who's been asking so many questions, excellent questions. Um, so do we plan to recruit scholars with lived experience? Yes, of course. But the interesting slash frustrating thing is that in the previous calls for book review editors, editorial team members, um, contributions, we often don't get people who identify as scholars with lived experience of forced migration. So I think those people are still far few in between, but through our connection all through to um, Carlton's LEARN project, which I happen to be attached with, I think there's a lot of 
I think, community building that's happening in particular with forced migration scholars um, and also organizing, I think, refu in refugee-led organizations. So I think there are some connections with us and scholars with lived experience. But yes, definitely, we've always um, hoped to be able to have people represented in the editorial team, but it's not always a call that has been taken up on. So we hope that we will have different representation in this respect at some point in the future. And I think we have a few more minutes to go. So if there are any more questions, you can also, again, um, email us uh, separately afterwards at refuge at yorku.ca. And again, that's not an empty email address that goes to nowhere. It goes to me and to Victoria Vinik who uh, cannot be here today. And again, I'm just thinking about um, migration backgrounds. Um, Victoria and is also definitely somebody with a migration background, but there is one more question that um, perhaps we should answer before we conclude. And for this question, Ranjita, I mean, we don't have a specific um, special issue, uh, journal issue coming up. Um, the special issues that we have so far have been uh, often brought to us as people say, we're, you know, we're running a conference, we're going to have a lot of sort of knowledge generated out of this, we'd like to find a venue where we can sort of publish a lot of our findings. Um, and that's where, as Michael talked about, um, people can certainly come to us with ideas within those. I mean, on a, in an upcoming or the current special issue on bureaucratic violence, there, there, are, there are articles related to LGBT youth uh, refugees. Um, and so it certainly is there, but it's not an ongoing one at open at the moment. Uh, certainly, again, like any other uh, issue related to forced migration, um, we're always interested to hear how people are sort of organizing, generating knowledge and what they might propose to us. And so certainly anyone would be more than welcome. We don't have anything right now that's sort of an open issue coming in that sense article that Chris is thinking about that is looking at bureaucratic violence in um, South America that is dealing with LGBTQ plus refugees. That one is, I think, in copy editing now. So that one should be coming out. So if that's something that is of interest to you, refugees certainly published lots of articles in this area. And um, Michelle is just reminding me that we have to finish in a couple of minutes. So last question is about Canada focused material. It depends on what gets sent to us, of course, because Refuge is based in Canada and is known to be the journal in Canada. We get contributions from Canadian colleagues. So that's a networking thing, but it's nothing that is an editorial policy that we have to publish or want to publish more stuff in Canada. I think it's more the opposite, but it depends on what um, comes in. But if you are um, publishing something um, internationally, we always like to encourage people to tell us what the sales pitch for our global audience is, because Refuge definitely is a global journal. And Michelle, I think perhaps uh, we should conclude it on that front because I think there are no more questions. And again, if you have more questions because we have to end the webinar, then um, please send us an email and we're happy to reply. But thank you very much for all your questions. It was lovely to e-meet you and we hope to see your manuscripts, perhaps in email um, or in the manuscript submission systems soon. So thank you very much and take good care and have a good day.